We've heard the word billionaire so often that most people don't realize just how absurd that amount of money is. To put it in perspective, the average American would have to work for about 20,000 years and not spend a single penny to make that amount of money. But what if you learned there was someone who makes even mega billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos look poor? Here's the story of Mansa Musa, the richest man who ever lived. Who's counting money anyway? Of course, it's not unheard of to be richer than the richest men in the world. Tech billionaires are nothing compared to men who had control of half the world. Between Augustus Caesar, who ruled the Roman Empire, William the Conqueror of the UK, and Akbar of India, there are plenty of rich rulers to go around. But these are men whose wealth can be estimated and put into words. Mansa Musa is a little different. While official estimates put his net worth to be around 500 billion, a number that is already astronomical, many historians agree that it was probably even more than that, with some even describing his wealth as incalculable. There are paintings of him on a throne of gold, holding a cup of gold in one hand and a golden scepter in the other sitting with a gold crown on his head. So take whatever amount of gold you can imagine. Mountains on mountains on mountains. Now double it and double it again. Because that's the only way to know just how rich Mansa Musa and his country were. Whatever Elon Musk has is chump change compared to his wealth. Rather than those tech billionaires, Mansa Musa would be better compared to Marvel's Black Panther. Sorry, Iron Man. Turns out you're not the richest superhero after all. Mansa Musa was so wealthy that his gifts alone wrecked an entire country's economy, as you'll learn later in the video. And what's surprising is that all his wealth happened to him completely by accident. All that just fell into his lap one day. Musa Keita wasn't supposed to have any of the wealth he became famous for. He was born in 2080 AD to the Keita dynasty which ruled over West Africa, but he wasn't the first son, which meant that the whole empire had first gone to his elder brother, Abu Bakr, instead. But Abu Bakr soon became obsessed with the idea of finding out what was beyond the Atlantic Ocean. By 1312, he had already taken one voyage to search more of the world, but this time, he wanted more. So Abu Bakr assembled a fleet of 2,000 ships with men, women, and slaves all on board and left to explore the sea. But he was not Columbus, and he would not find any distant lands. He never returned from this expedition. Some people have guessed that Musa was behind the disappearance of his brother. According to them, Musa was a power-hungry maniac who would have done anything for power. In a grand conspiracy for the throne, he had his brother killed, then made up the voyage and the disappearance. Whatever you can say about your siblings, at least they're better than this. Of course, this account is widely contested, and most historians agree that Musa had no hand in any conspiracy for the throne. We can only guess how Musa felt about the fact that his brother completely disappeared one day, but it meant that he now ruled one of the richest empires in the world. Who wouldn't want to wake up one day and suddenly be king? But Musa soon became a more capable leader than anyone could have imagined, because his empire would only grow even more under his command. Mansa Musa's Rule Musa Keita became the ninth sultan of the West African Mali Empire, and was awarded the title of Mansa, meaning emperor. And what an emperor he was! According to historical accounts, Mansa Musa did not lose a single time on the battlefield, and ended up annexing 24 cities, including Timbuktu. The kingdom stretched for about 2,000 miles, from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the modern-day Niger, taking in parts of what is now Senegal and Mauritania. But the battlefield was only a side effect of his true accomplishments. The wealth of his empire kept skyrocketing because of his focus on mining gold and salt. His practice of trading elephant ivory just added to how rich the empire was. Many of the territories he wanted to conquer simply joined his empire out of their own free will because they knew the quality of life would be so much higher. 
Not even having to fight to win is a whole different kind of achievement. Who knows if his brother would have been able to do the same thing. If there's anything we can learn from Musa, it's how to make the best of an unexpected situation. While European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources, the African continent flourished. At one point, his empire alone had over half of the world's wealth, and a wealthier nation meant that all those riches poured into the emperor's coffers. He also became known as one of the most generous rulers the nation had ever seen. But this generosity would ruin foreign territories for generations to come when he visited them. The Most Generous Pilgrimage Mansa Musa wanted his name to be known outside of his borders, and what better way to do that than tell people just how filthy rich he was. In 1324, he left for Arabia on what would be described as the most extravagant pilgrimage in human history. And we're not just talking about hundreds of people, or even thousands. We're talking 60,000 men, women, and slaves. Imagine, camel drivers responsible for heaps on top of heaps of pure gold. Even the slaves were decked head to toe in pure white Persian silk and jewelry gleaming in the sun. They traveled over six and a half thousand kilometers, and anyone who came across them during this time would know the king's name and what he set out to do. But once he reached Cairo, the capital of Egypt, things started getting a little rough. According to historical texts, Musa was invited by a deputy of the Sultan al-Nazir to meet with the other king, but Musa declined, claiming that he was only passing through the city on his journey to Mecca. The people of Cairo thought this to be very suspicious. Many of them came to the conclusion that the only reason why Musa did not want to meet the other sultan was because of the protocol that anyone who came into the court had to kiss the ground and Sultan Nazir's hand. When the two finally met because of the constant pressure, Musa refused to kiss the feet of the sultan. The meeting almost took a turn for the worst, and at that point, it was anyone's guess what would happen. Would the ego of two kings cause war to break out? The possibility was very real. Thankfully, Musa bent first and greeted the other sultan the way Al-Nazir wanted, which was for the best. When his country's peace was on the line, he was willing to sacrifice his own ego, which is a decision we can all get behind. When Al-Nazir offered Musa and his party a place to stay, in return, Musa left a piece of his wealth there. From the markets to the royal palace to even the slums, the gold flooded the whole city. Suddenly, everyone had piles of rare metal at home. The emperor gave so much of his gold away in a lavish display of absolute extravagance that it destabilized the entire economy. At that time, gold was a very important trade material in the region, but Mansa Musa bringing so much of it dropped its value so suddenly that the economy wasn't able to survive the shockwave. According to various modern sources, Mansa Musa's pilgrimage led to about $1.5 billion of economic losses across the Middle East. Some say he tried to fix Cairo's situation on the way back home by taking back the gold on loan at extremely high interest rates. But even 10 years after he left, the area was feeling the effects of the inflation. Al-Nazir probably hated Musa after this, but still, when historians visited Cairo after a full decade, people were still telling tales of the king's kindness. Give a man a pot of gold, and he'll remember you forever, it seems. Needless to say, he was even more extravagant when it came to his own kingdom. How else did he spend his money? The king returned from Mecca with several Islamic scholars, including those who were direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, as well as a poet and architect who was named Abu Ishaq. The king paid Abu Ishaq over 200 kilograms of gold to build the famous Jingerber Mosque in Timbuktu. In today's money, that amount would have costed over $8 million, and the king got his money's worth too. Despite being built from only wood and bricks made from mud, the mosque stood tall and was in use for over 500 years. The city soon became a center of education, arts, and literature. Soon people from all over the world were coming to study at the Sankor University. It became the El Dorado of Africa, and along with the city, 
the king became immortalized as well. Word of his wealth and generosity had spread all over the world after his pilgrimage. Everything that Musa had set out to do had succeeded. By the 14th century, he had been drawn in the 1375 Catalan Atlas, which was an important resource for navigators of medieval Europe. The atlas depicted Musa sitting on a throne with a gold scepter and crown, holding a gold nugget in his hands. He had literally placed himself on the map. Not only is he credited with starting the tradition of education in West Africa, but he was also the one who was responsible for the wealth of his country because of all the natural resources he had cultivated. The region would be enjoying the fruits of his labor for generations to come. By the time the king died somewhere between 1322 to 1327, he had done all he could to ensure he would be remembered by the world. Then why does no one know him? After Mansa Musa died, the empire was inherited by his sons, who were not able to hold it together. The smaller states started to break off to become independent until eventually, the empire was a shadow of what it once was. The arrival of the Europeans and the colonization of Africa sealed the deal. They had ensured that the history of the medieval period would only ever be seen through the eyes of the West. But despite not being remembered by everyone, Mansa Musa had done more for his nation than many other rulers are able to. Not only is he the richest man in history, but under him, the Mali Empire not only became the richest country in the world, but also became a center for learning and art. He set an example of how to be generous and uncorrupt, and how if you work hard for the benefit of your nation, it's going to benefit you in return as well. Above all, with the example of what happened in Cairo with Al Nasir, he taught everyone that for a ruler, the peace of the country should come before anything else, including your own ego. He taught everyone in his country the importance of education and gave every other ruler a blueprint that they can only strive to follow. Maybe he was as close as we could get to a real-life Black Panther. Could anyone have asked for a better ruler? What do you think about the richest man in history? Have you ever heard of Mansa Musa before? Let us know in the comments below. And if you liked this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and stick around for the next video.